Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from BioFire Diagnostics. My name is Paul Aronson. I'm an associate professor of pediatrics and of emergency medicine at Yale School of Medicine. And I'm an attending physician in the pediatric emergency department at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. Um, and today I'll be talking about uh, diagnostic technologies uh, for bacterial meningitis and viral encephalitis and meningitis, uh, primarily in children. So when considering a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis in a previously healthy child, we think about it mostly within two age groups. First, our infants aged 60 days or younger who present with fever, in whom the prevalence of bacterial meningitis is around 1%, and in whom a diagnosis of herpes simplex virus encephalitis, although rare, is also a consideration, particularly in infants aged 21 days or younger. In children older than two months of age, we consider the diagnosis of bacterial meningitis or herpes simplex virus encephalitis based on a combination of symptoms and physical signs. Now, I used the term previously healthy earlier as there are certain populations of children, such as those with ventricular peritoneal shunts, who are at higher risk for central nervous system infections and who we approach differently. I'll focus today on previously healthy children. Once you've decided to perform a lumbar puncture to obtain CSF testing in a child in whom you're considering a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis or herpes simplex vir virus encephalitis, the gold standard for definitive diagnosis is CSF culture for bacterial pathogens or CSF herpes simplex virus PCR testing. Though CSF PCR testing for other viruses such as enterovirus may also be employed to test for viral meningitis. The challenge with diagnosis is that CSF culture may take 24 to 36 hours to grow a pathogen if one is present, while PCR testing will often take 24 hours to result if in-house testing is even available. So additionally, if the child was pre-treated with antimicrobial agents, the CSF culture may not grow bacteria even in the presence of bacterial meningitis. While waiting 24 to 36 hours for the results of these definitive tests, Clinicians therefore use readily available testing results, such as CSF white blood cell count and CSF gram stain, to determine whether the child more likely has bacterial versus viral meningitis. However, CSF white blood cell count can be elevated in both bacterial and viral meningitis, and particularly in infants aged 60 days or younger, can uncommonly be normal even in the presence of bacterial meningitis. CSF gram stain has a reported sensitivity of, of as low as 35% depending on the study, and so can be negative even in the setting of bacterial meningitis. Ultimately, while awaiting CSF culture or viral PCR testing results, clinicians must weigh the risks of hospitalizing a child on empiric antimicrobial treatment for bacterial meningitis and or acyclovir for HSV encephalitis against the risks of delaying treatment for potentially life-threatening bacterial and viral infections. Availability of rapid diagnostics can inform this decision-making at the point of care. The film array meningitis encephalitis panel was the first FDA-cleared multiplex PCR panel and allows for the simultaneous detection of 14 microorganisms with a turnaround time of approximately one hour. For the remainder of the podcast, I'll refer to the film array as the ME panel. The ME panel tests for six bacterial pathogens, seven viruses, and one fungus, and has been extensively studied in both adults and children. I'm going to summarize the pediatric data since that is my specialty. However, the data is largely similar in adults. The best way for me to summarize the test characteristics of the ME panel is using the data from a 2019 meta-analysis published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection by Tansarli and Chapin. Using the data from the eight studies included in the meta-analysis, the combined test characteristics for the ME panel are sensitivity 90.2%, specificity 97.7%, positive predictive value 85.1%, negative predictive value 98.5%, positive likelihood ratio 
38.8, and negative likelihood ratio 0.1. Although the authors of the meta-analysis were not able to calculate sensitivities and specificities of the ME panel for individual organisms, using the data gathered, I calculated the overall sensitivity for five of the six bacterial organisms in the ME panel as 96.8%. Given these test characteristics, what are the benefits and limitations of using the ME panel for diagnosis of bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis or viral encephalitis? Overall, the test characteristics are highly favorable, with a high positive likelihood ratio well above 10 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.1, both of which indicate that a positive or negative ME panel result, respectively, can substantially alter a clinician's pretest probability of meningitis or encephalitis in a clinically meaningful way. Given the rapid turnaround time of one hour, identification of bacterial pathogen earlier could lead to more rapid narrowing of antimicrobial therapy to target the specific organism identified, thereby supporting antimicrobial stewardship efforts. In the setting of a negative ME panel test with a low pretest probability of bacterial meningitis or HSV encephalitis, the clinician could withhold empiric antimicrobial or acyclovir therapy and discharge the child without need for hospitalization or with a shorter hospitalization. Multiple studies, including several published in the year 2020, have demonstrated shorter duration of antimicrobial therapy and acyclovir with the use of the ME panel compared with children managed without use of the ME panel. Costs have also been reported to be lower with use of the ME panel in several studies, though future cost analyses need to also account for the cost of purchase of the ME panel, the testing itself, and the service of the equipment. The ME panel can also identify bacterial pathogens in the setting of antimicrobial pretreatment when CSF cultures are frequently negative. Some children with elevated CSF white blood cell count but negative CSF culture after antimicrobial pretreatment receive two to three weeks of antimicrobial therapy for presumptive bacterial meningitis. Conceivably, the clinical suspicion was not high, a negative ME panel in this setting could prevent unnecessary treatment for meningitis. However, there are also limitations to the ME panel. First is that the ME panel does not provide antimicrobial susceptibilities, which necessitates CSF culture. Second, while the ME panel includes common pathogens that cause bacterial meningitis in children, it does not include some uncommon bacterial pathogens, particularly in febrile infants aged 60 days or younger, such as Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and other gram-negative organisms. Third, even though the sensitivity and specificity of the ME panel are high, both false positive and false negative results have been reported. False positive results with streptococcus pneumoniae, for example, may result in unnecessary antimicrobial treatment for bacterial meningitis, while false negative results may result in undertreatment. For all the aforementioned reasons, the ME panel results must be taken into account with the clinical picture and pretest probability of bacterial meningitis or viral encephalitis, and the CSF culture must always be sent in conjunction with the ME panel. This is particularly important for children in whom the clinician has a high clinical suspicion for bacterial meningitis. Even with a negative ME panel, the clinical suspicion may be high enough to warrant empiric antimicrobial therapy until CSF culture results are available. False positive viral tests are also possible with the ME panel. In all the herpes viruses in the ME panel, herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster virus, HHV6, can establish latent infections. Therefore, a positive result for these viruses may be due to a primary infection or alternatively to a latent infection. Standalone viral PCR tests are highly sensitive but take up to 24 hours to result. And so particularly for HSV testing, the ME panel should be confirmed with the standalone HSV PCR if HSV is suspected. Speaking of viral tests, the inclusion of HHV6 in the ME panel raises the question of what to do with a positive result as it's an uncommon virus tested for in the CSF. Dan Tulluri et al. published a case series of febrile infants aged 60 days or younger with HHV6 detected in the CSF. Unlike enterovirus, which uncommonly occurs as a co-infection with a bacterial pathogen, detection of HHV6 in the CSF may or may not represent an active infection. Further study is needed to better characterize the clinical significance of detection of HHV6 in the CSF. I'm now going to give a few case examples using a population of children in whom we frequently evaluate uh, for meningitis and or viral encephalitis. And those are febrile infants aged 60 days or younger. For example, um, say that we have a 40-day-old 
infant who's febrile, um, in whom it is standard of care to obtain urine and blood testing, and then to use the results of that testing to decide on whether to do CSF testing, particularly for bacterial meningitis. If the urine and blood testing are abnormal and the clinical suspicion for bacterial meningitis is high enough, we will undergo uh, CSF testing with traditional tests, CSF white blood cell count, protein, glucose, and then ultimately CSF culture, which is the definitive test for bacterial meningitis. Using the ME panel in that particular infant has several potential benefits. If in one hour, the ME panel is positive for enterovirus, but negative for bacterial pathogens, the clinician might attribute the fever to enterovirus if the clinical suspicion for bacterial meningitis was low enough, even in the setting of uh, abnormal urine and blood testing results. Currently, the enterovirus PCR standalone test takes approximately 24 hours to result. And so these infants are routinely admitted on antimicrobial therapy while awaiting both CSF culture results and enterovirus PCR results. If the enterovirus was positive on the ME panel in an hour, that result would likely be available in the emergency department, which would give clinician information on whether to even initiate antimicrobial therapy at all. Perhaps the clinician might admit the child off of antimicrobial therapy, thereby sparing the child from unnecessary antimicrobial treatment. Alternatively, if the clinical suspicion for bacterial meningitis was low enough and there was good follow-up, perhaps the child could be discharged with very close follow-up while awaiting CSF culture with or without a single dose of antimicrobial therapy prior to discharge. Alternatively, if in an hour the ME panel was positive for bacterial pathogens such as E. coli, the clinician could use that inflammation in the emergency department to treat the child aggressively for bacterial meningitis with broad spectrum antimicrobial therapy aimed at potentially resistant gram-negative organisms. CSF gram stain has reported sensitivity of as high as 90%, but also as low as 35%, depending on the study, and so can be negative even in the setting of bacterial meningitis. To close, I'll briefly touch on a different technology, metagenomic next-generation sequencing, in which billions of DNA fragments can be simultaneously sequenced. This allows for very broad bacterial and viral detection in the CSF, without limitation to, for example, the 14 microorganisms included in the ME panel. In 2019, Wilson et al. published a prospective cohort study of 204 pediatric and adult hospitalized patients who underwent CSF metagenomic next-generation sequencing. The results were mixed and that 13 patients had microorganisms detected by metagenomic next-generation sequencing only, seven of which resulted in alteration of treatment. However, 26 patients had negative metagenomic next-generation sequencing but had microorganisms detected by other methods. Additionally, the mean time to results for metagenomic next-generation sequencing was 90 hours. Additional studies are needed to evaluate this emerging diagnostic technology in the evaluation of children and adults with suspected meningitis or encephalitis. In conclusion, the ME panel has an overall high sensitivity and specificity for bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis and encephalitis, and has the potential to aid clinicians in decision-making at the point of care. However, the ME panel and other technologies for diagnosis of central nervous system infections should be used in combination with, a cl with clinical and other laboratory data, including traditional diagnostic tests, such as CSF culture. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast, and please continue on to answer the questions to receive your CME credit.